All right, hello world. So, welcome to how to prepare your resume and yourself for technical interviews. For the past several years, CS50 has been holding a workshop like this, both on campus as well as online, for students who are going off into the real world, whether it's for summer internships or full time jobs or the like. Beyond taking classes like CS50 and typically higher level courses in computer science as well, there's a good amount of preparation that you can do if interested in working in the tech world or really in the real world more generally. And what we thought we'd do is bring back one of our favorite alumni, one of CS50's former head teaching fellows. Tommy McWilliam.、Uh, Tommy is literally the person I turn to when I don't know the answer to some technical concept. He is the one I turn to myself when I want advice.、Um, and this is because he's such an amazing technologist and also an amazing teacher. And he's had the opportunity over the past several years to work at companies like Quora and then most recently his own company, Serenade,、uh, which focuses on applications of artificial intelligence to accessibility of computers. So we are so happy, Tommy McWilliam. To have you back here with us and allow me to turn the floor now over to you. Awesome. Well, well thanks so much for the intro. And hello, everybody.、Uh, really excited to be here and、uh, talk through、uh, how to prepare your resume and yourself for technical interviews. So, here's、uh, what we're going to cover today. So, first, talk a bit about choosing companies and thinking about where you might want to interview.、Uh, next, talk about resumes and some do's and don'ts there. Uh, and then, lastly, just walking through the whole interview process what you can do before the interview to prepare, how to handle yourself during the interview, and then what you can do after the interview as well. So, let's start with choosing companies. There are lots of different tech companies out there, and even companies you know, using technology in some way. And so, there's lots and lots of choices often as you start to enter the job market. And so, I put together a list of four questions that you might want to ask yourself to sort of filter down that really large list into a list of companies that you would really be excited about interviewing. Since you, know, you probably don't want to be doing hundreds or thousands of interviews, it's good to sort of filter this down, at least at the beginning, to a smaller set of companies to start with. So, the first question to ask yourself is what are you looking for out of this role? Whether it be an internship or a full time role, you know, everybody is looking for something different. It could be you're, you know, you're early on in your career and you're really looking for growth opportunities and strong mentorship.、Uh, or it could be that you're later down in your career and you're really looking to take your career to the next level and then lead a team and look for opportunities for personal growth. Uh, and similarly, there's lots of factors that are important to different people. Some people really care about location. Some people really want to be remote, especially now.、Uh, for some people, they're, they're at a place in their life where they can take a, a higher risk role with a, an equity, with a compensation that's more equity heavy.、Uh, and other people are, are not. They're sort of in a place where they, the liquid compensation is more important to them. And with all of these questions, it, it's really important to know that there's no right answer here. You know, you're, no one is better or worse for looking to join a small company versus. A large one, or、um, you know, having a remote company versus a non remote company. Everyone is, is really different. And so, you know, as you're reading articles online or on Twitter, you might see some really biased perspectives. But really take some time to ask yourself what is it that you want?、Uh, and recognize that what you want and what you need might be different than what other people want or need. The second question to ask yourself is would you really be excited to work with this team every day? And I think about this in two parts. There's what the team is working on. So there's the product and the company and their mission. But then there's also the people that you're working with. You know, keep in mind you're going to be spending a lot of time working with these people and on this specific project or mission. So make sure that's something that you're really excited about,、uh, or else you're going to find yourself in you know, a few months into your new role, not really wanting to be there anymore, and then you know, having to start this process all over again. Next, think about whether or not what you value aligns with what the company values. So, most tech companies will publish somewhere on their website something like their value statement or their mission or their vision.、Uh, and you know, take some time to read through that and see if it fits with what you're looking for. You know, some companies in their values, they'll talk a lot about you know, close collaboration and mentorship, and that's really important to them as a culture. And so, they've built a culture that centers around. Mentorship and people helping each other. And so, if that's something that's important to you, that, that company might make sense. Or, or maybe you go to a company's values page and they talk a lot about being really small and scrappy and not having a lot of process and you know, putting impact above everything else. And if that's something that appeals to you, something that's less stable and something where you, know, you can just go and, and do stuff, you know, maybe that company is, is right for you. So, 
companies want to publish these because it helps them differentiate themselves from the many, many companies out there. So before you interview somewhere, just take some time to try to find those values and just get a sense of, of what the company's culture is like in advance. And lastly, think about whether or not this company's size is right for you. Uh, the size of a company is going to make a really, really big impact on what their culture and process looks like. Um, so here's a, here's a helpful diagram. This, this originally came from uh, Dustin Mostovitz, the CEO of Asana, in one of his talks. But I think this is, this is so good that I, that I like to talk about it as well. So you can basically filter down these companies into three groups. There's the really small startups, usually less than 50 people. There's the mid-sized startup. And you know, I think now it's probably even more in the range of 500 to maybe 1,000 would still be considered a, a mid-sized startup. And then you have these large corporations, that, you know, 1,000, 5,000 plus. Um, and so you can see here that a lot of things are going to vary. So one, one uh, clear one here is this mentorship row. So at a really small startup, you're probably not going to have a ton of time for mentorship. You know, everyone is really focused on getting this product off the ground and getting this business off the ground that engineers can't spend a ton of time sort of mentoring each other. And maybe that's what you're looking for. Maybe you're the type of person who likes to learn on their own and or has enough experience that they don't feel like mentorship is that important. So that could fit for you. At a mid-sized company, there's going to be a little bit of mentorship here. You know, maybe you'll have a, uh, a mentor assigned when you first uh, join the company who you can go to with questions. Maybe there's some you know, documentation in the forms of presentations or a few sort of uh, intro sessions when you join the company that you know, might be called a boot camp. So you know, there's some light mentorship. And at really large companies, you're going to see uh, a ton of this. So there are some companies where they'll even have an, an iOS university where you can go and learn iOS just at Google or just at Facebook and, and sort of how they do it. And there's sort of a, a ton of built out structure there. So again, there, there's some exceptions here. Maybe there are small companies that do focus a lot on mentorship. But generally speaking, the size of the company can give you a, a pretty decent picture of, of what the day to day is going to look like. OK, so that's it for choosing companies. So let's, let's talk a bit about resumes. And the most important thing that I want you to take away from this part of the talk is that resumes are not that important. I think a lot of people spend a ton of time stressing over getting the absolutely perfect resume. Uh, but that's not often the best use of time, especially as you're trying to prepare so much to succeed in these interviews. So uh, when, when I was doing recruiting and have talked to a bunch of recruiters, the average time that a recruiter or a hiring manager is going to spend looking at your resume is no more than 30 seconds. We get a lot of resumes coming in every day, and so a recruiter isn't going to be agonizing over your resume for 20 or 30 minutes. They're going to skim it for 30 seconds and make a decision about you know, what your next steps are going to be. So to that end, I've put together these 10 simple resume rules that as long as you follow all 10 of these, you're going to end up with a resume that is good enough. OK, so number one, one page, no exceptions. There is no reason you should ever su submit a resume that is more than one page. Maybe there's exceptions here if you're in academia and you're submitting a CV, which is hopefully more than one page. But if you're just applying to a typical tech company, do not spend more than one page on your resume. There are prolific engineers like the inventor of Python. Their resume is one page. Yours doesn't have to be longer than theirs is. Number two, which is related, is make it easy to skim. Keep in mind that a hiring manager or recruiter is not spending very much time reading your resume. If they have to dig around in a small font or try to find some piece of information they're looking for, like when you graduated or you know, what internships you've had, make their life absolutely as easy as possible so they can spend that 30 seconds and get a really good picture of what you're actually bringing to the table. Number three is make your contact information obvious. I've seen a lot of resumes where I thought, this looks like a great candidate, but then there was no way to contact them. They didn't have an email address or a LinkedIn or anything. Or maybe it was so buried down the page that I was sort of frustrated after reading their resume. You know, I'm sure I still contacted them anyway. But again, you want to make this as easy as possible on the person who's reading your resume. So make it easy to contact you, since that's the whole purpose of, of having a resume. Number four is you want to highlight specific accomplishments. So as much as you can, when you've gone through an internship or put out a personal project, be specific about what you did. Maybe at your internship, you improved the speed of some area of the product by 10%. If you can put that in your resume, definitely do that. 
uh, or if you've worked on a personal project, talk about what technologies you used or if it's out there in the world, how many people have, are using it and, and what impact it's having. And the more specific you can be, the better. Um, keep in mind, of course, that in, in some internships and roles, companies have non-disclosure agreements that will prevent you from saying you know, how much you increased revenue, for instance. So don't, don't break those, obviously. But as much as you can, try to highlight specific things that you did at internships as opposed to I wrote code there for a few months. Number five is if you have interesting personal projects, definitely include them. For instance, if you have a GitHub link where you've published some cool side project or a library or something you've built, include it on your resume. Uh, that's something I like to do as a, as a hiring manager, just to get a sense of what this person likes to work on, what their code style is like. Uh, and it sort of shows what their interests are. You know, maybe you made a personal project that aligns with some hobby you have, and it sort of helps me get a sense of, of what you're like as a person. But again, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time reviewing all of your code in GitHub or something like that. I'm just going to skim it to sort of get a flavor of, uh, of what we're getting into at this part of the process. So if you have interesting stuff, include it. If you don't, not a deal breaker. Uh, but if you have it and it's good, definitely showcase it. Next up, uh, please do not include charts or ratings on your resume. Uh, I've seen a lot of resumes where somebody will say they're, you know, a, a five-star team player and a, a four-star communicator, and I immediately ask myself, what does what does a four-star communicator even mean? Or similarly, somebody will say they're they're an expert at, at jQuery, but they're only a proficient in Python. And it doesn't it doesn't mean anything to me. Like, who who is the expert in in Python? The inventor of Python, or someone who's been doing it for a year? It's it's super unclear what that bar is. Uh, so this basically adds nothing of value. Instead, talk about the specific things you've done. If you have built some cool web application with Python, tell me about that. Don't tell me about your, your self-assessment with Python, because it, it's not that interesting to me. Similarly, uh, don't include an objective statement. Uh, and this might vary a bit around different industries and even different cultures. But uh, for typical tech companies, this is just a waste of space. We know what your objective is. Your objective is to get a job as a developer. You don't need to tell me that. That's sort of why we're going through this whole process. So if you have an objective at the top of your resume that says, my objective is to secure a job as a, in a fast-moving company where I can learn a lot, I know. There's, there's really no point in, in putting that in your resume when you just, there's all this other stuff that needs to fit on this one page. Next, uh, this is the easiest one. Use a professional looking email address. Uh, if you don't have one, there are lots of ways to create new email addresses. So I would definitely recommend looking into something like Gmail. Uh, I've seen resumes that have come in. I, I'll never forget this one email. There was some person's name, I forget, and it was their name, 12345678909876543213291 at gmail.com. There's no reason. There's no reason for that to be the email that's on your resume. Uh, like you know, you're you're trying to get into the door as much as possible. If there's anything silly, just try to just try to avoid that. Next up, include relevant links. Like I said, if you have a LinkedIn, if you have a GitHub, if you're a designer and you have a portfolio, definitely include that on your resume. The recruiter or hiring manager might not click it, and so don't build a resume that depends on them clicking on this because they might not. But if they're sort of on the fence or if they're just curious, they probably will go and, and check out these links. So include anything that you have. And lastly, don't sweat the aesthetics. There's a lot, don't, don't spend a lot of time trying to get precise formatting and colors and layouts or, or trolling through you know, millions of paid templates for resumes. The content is what's really important. A, a nice looking resume might catch my eye, but I'm really focused on just this content and skimming what have you done in the past few years? And really, you know, what type of role do I think that you'd fit into well at this company? So that's it. Those are 10 really simple rules. Uh, as long as you can follow these, you're going to be in good shape. Tommy, can I interject yes. with a question from Mohammed from the US? For sure. Mohammed asks, what are some good programming projects that aren't too complex or too simple that would make his resume stand out? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. So one, one thing that you could lean on is any final projects that you've done in classes, um, especially if that final project was something that you got to build yourself. Uh, you know, don't, don't put CS50's PSET1 uh, on your resume, since everyone has done that. But your final project is, is a good opportunity to build something that you care about. So that, that's a pretty good one. 
Um, but in general, I would just sort of thinking about, you know, think about a project that's interesting to you. I know I almost don't want to give some cookie cutter idea because then it, it becomes that, it becomes some cookie cutter thing. But, you know, if you're interested in, you know, hiking, you know, you could make an app about hiking spots in your area. Or if you're, you have a dog, you could, you know, sort of talk about some like advice for new dog parents or uh, I'm a big baseball fan. So I could build, you know, a scoreboard or some stats application. So just think about a project that would be pretty interesting to you and, and build that. Cool. So now I have a, a couple of resumes. Uh, these are both fake because I just went to Google Images and searched example resume. Um, and so I wanted to, given these 10 rules now, I wanted to get people's thoughts on what works about these resumes and, and what doesn't. Yeah. So a couple of things. Um, number one, on the first look, it's pretty small fonts. Uh, I really have to squint to, to look at it. Um, there are graphs. Um, it, it could be a lot more concise and uh, a lot, you know, there's some objective words and graphs that I don't really know what that means. Uh, and so that's what I think first uh, on the first look. Yeah, I think those are, those are really good observations. You can see here that the top left, there's this very long objective statement that ends with this person is looking for a data science position, which I already knew. And in the bottom right, there's all these skills where it, they're sort of, they have high accuracy, but lower analytical skills, and nothing is less than what appears to be a four out of five. So it doesn't add a ton of value. That space could absolutely be reclaimed to make this a lot easier to, to skim. Let's do uh, one more thought before we move on to the next one. Yeah, I thought it was a little bit clunky because the education has um, clubs and honors and um, graduated with distinction and the skills and then volunteering and certificates. So there's a little bit of redundancy and overlap in all of those aspects that I think could be blocked out and maybe a little bit unnecessary. Yeah, I think that that's a really good observation. It also sort of contributes to making it harder to skim because I'm at the top of the page looking at education and I go down to the bottom of the page and we're actually back into education again. So it's sort of not optimizing for that make it easy to skim rule. So some positives about this resume, uh, if you actually read the content under work experience, which is unfortunately a very small part of this resume, but it's actually pretty good. They're very specific about what they're doing. They assisted research, they collected data sets, they participated in these meetings with execs, um, the same with the next one. So it, it is pretty specific about what they're doing. They didn't just say, you know, I analyzed some data. So that's one. And uh, here is another one. So let's do uh, reactions to this. So I think there's a lot of content and there's no white space at all. So it looks very scary at first glance. I think that is exactly the same reaction I had, is that it looks very scary at first glance. It's super, super dense. This is not easy to skim. Um, something that's actually in really small font is where they worked, which is probably the first thing I care about. Um, so yes, very, very difficult to skim. Let's have uh, one other reaction. Yeah, it's too clumsy. I don't think the uh, you can read this in 30 seconds and skim it out. So it's too much of info. You need you need clarity in the information which is not there here. Yeah, like if I look at this core expertise section, this to me is a little bit strange since it's sort of listing things that are redundant with this professional experience section. Uh, and then this thing at the top right with this like intersecting circles, I've stared at this for a while and I still don't know what that means. Uh, and so it's, again, I think it's trying to do these like bar charts or something fancy, which uh, do not recommend, just be really straightforward with the resume. Um, on the positive side, the content here is, is also actually pretty good. Uh, like if you look at the second one, so it's developed a VMware EX5 driver for next generation operating system, super specific. Um, the, the bullet above it actually has a nice metric of expedited uh, triage of software regression, correcting issues in 24 hours. That's a nice metric. And similarly above, there's experienced a team with 60% attrition. So I really like the metrics and the content here. But again, similar, similar to the last one, should be really, really easy to skim, which it's not. Uh, and then lastly, contact information here, super easy to find. It's right at the top. You can call this person at 000000. 000, 000, 000. Um, so that's good that, that they have that as well as a portfolio link. So that's it for resumes. Like I said, you're, you're only going to be capturing about 30 seconds of attention from your hiring manager or recruiter. So if you have the choice between spending another three days changing the font on your resume or another three days practicing for the interview itself, definitely pick the second one. So let's talk about the interview itself now. So we're going to break this down into those three parts, what you can do before the interview happens, what you can do during the interview itself, and what you can do afterwards. So let's start by talking about what to expect out of a technical interview. If you've done some of these before, this might be obvious, 
Um, but if you're sort of new to the game, this is sort of what you can expect coming in. So first, timing. If you can, interview as early as possible. Uh, if you're an undergrad, and particularly in the U.S., a lot of people are interviewing for internships for next summer during the previous summer. So maybe in, you know, now in August or September 2020, people are already interviewing for internships and full-time roles for summer 2021. If you don't have time to interview now, maybe you have some, some stuff going on or there's lots of sort of classes happening right now and you don't have time, that's okay. Companies aren't going to shut down the interviewing loop or the interviewing funnel until maybe the end of the year. But if you can, try to interview as early as possible just so that you don't end up in a situation where some company has already filled up its interview, its sort of its uh, internship class for the next year. You know, as, as much as companies don't like to sort of stop interviewing, there is a reality where if, you know, you have some 50-person startup and they have already got 20 interns, they probably can't take any more. And so if you wait too long, you, you might miss the boat. So interview as, as early as possible, um, but it's not, a, not the end of the world if you're not interviewing right this second. Next is to plan interviewing into your schedule. Uh, interviewing takes a lot of time and often a lot of emotional toll, uh, especially if things aren't going super well. So just plan that into your schedule. Uh, maybe, you know, drop one extracurricular during interviewing season or, uh, you know, unofficially take maybe an easier class or wait to take that super hard class until the spring semester. Um, but just make sure you have enough time for interviewing and almost treat it like it's a, another class or another extracurricular in your schedule. And lastly, make sure you're looking for opportunities geared at your experience. And again, this is going to affect timing as well. So a lot of these larger companies will have programs designed especially for uh, people who are newer to, to engineering. So if Google and Facebook, for instance, have you know, apprenticeship programs, they're often called something like Facebook University or um, the Google Engineering Practicum. And they're, they're designed for people who don't have a lot of CS experience. And so try to look out for those programs, which often have totally separate interview processes and sometimes separate timing. But it's really important to try to go for an opportunity that's geared at your experience. If you're a first year university student, you don't want to be trying to get a role that's designed for rising seniors because the expectations for the interview process are just going to be really different. So uh, hopefully if you end up applying to a role that doesn't fit your experience, some recruiter will, will move you the right way, but they, they might not. So just make sure that you're looking for opportunities designed for your level of experience. Okay, so the entire process from end to end, uh, it's going to have a few different parts. And every company is going to have a different process. So there's no one, you know, uniform process that's going to follow. But generally pick, generally speaking, here, here's what the picture looks like. So companies might start with a coding challenge. Uh, this is typically something that's not designed to take more than 30 or 45 minutes, but just taking some time on your own or maybe in uh, a site that lets you sort of view a question and submit uh, your code online. Just very simply, you know, here's write a function that takes this as input and it takes this other thing as output. And you're not, you know, you're not, you're not actually speaking to anyone. You're just sort of doing this on your own. Uh, and maybe the site has a, a timer or something like that. But that's, that's often the first step. Um, some companies don't do this. Uh, some companies do multiple of these, but that, that's a reasonable first step. The next step you can expect is a technical phone screen. So this is a conversation probably with some engineer who works at the company you're interviewing for um, and going through uh, some technical questions. And so this, this is an area where we're, we're going to focus most of the talk on, so I, I won't dive too much into here. Uh, the next is going to be an on-site interview. So same sort of types of questions that you'd see in the technical phone screen, but instead of happening over the phone, they're either happening over Zoom nowadays, or um, hopefully soon they'll be happening more in person, give you a chance to sort of meet people face to face. And then last, some companies will do a take home. And this take home might come earlier, it might come later, but this is sort of a, a longer coding challenge that gives you the opportunity to build something larger and, and showcase your skills that way. Um, you know, what, what companies do here and, and where this is in the process is really varied. Some don't do it at all, uh, but it's becoming more popular, especially now when people don't get to meet in person. It's just to get more signal from folks by giving them a, a larger take-home assignment. So we're going to focus most of today on the technical phone screen and the on-site. So next, so what are the expectations of you as the interviewer? So in some sense, this is what the interviewer is looking for out of you when you're doing the interview. So first up, we're looking for your ability to think through a problem. 
we're going to be giving you a problem that you haven't seen before and look at how you respond to that and how you can reason through the different parts of that problem. Next, we're looking for you to write functional code. Uh, unless your interviewer tells you they are not looking for you to write pseudocode, they're not looking for you to, to write a paragraph describing how to solve the problem, they're looking for you to write functional code that's clean and correct. Next, we're looking for you to fix issues. In, in your functional code, if there are bugs or problems with that, we want you to fix them. If we tell you there's a bug, we want you to find it. Um, but more importantly, we want you to try to find proactively issues with your code yourself. Next, we want you to reason about the runtime of your code. Um, what's less important is getting the exact O of whatever correct. What's more important is recognizing, OK, this seems like it's going to be exponential. I bet there's a way that I can make this faster. And lastly, and, and probably most importantly, we're looking for your ability to communicate clearly. Even if you write code perfectly, that does not mean that you have done well in the interview. What's really important is your ability to communicate ideas and communicate with the interviewer so they get a picture of what it would be like to work with you on a day-to-day -day where they probably have to collaborate and communicate with you. So these are the five things to look out for. These are, if I'm an interviewer, this is what I'm looking for out of the interview. And so this is what you should make sure that you're doing. So broadly they're speaking, there you'll run into maybe five different types of interviews on either the phone screen or the on-site. Um, and I'll just quickly walk through what each of these looks like. So the first one is the algorithms interview. And this is probably the most common, and, and again, what we're going to spend the most time on today. But this is an interview where you're given a problem of the form, write a function that takes this as input and takes and returns this as output. And what's interesting about these problems is that the code is often very simple but figuring out what the solution is, is the hard part. So you might spend in a, in a 45 minute interview, you might spend 20 to 30 minutes just sort of reasoning through what the solution is. And then to write up that solution, it might only be you know five to 10 lines of code that you can write up in five minutes, but getting to those five to 10 lines took a lot of time and thought. So if you find yourself you know, sort of spending a lot of time trying to think of the solution, that, that might be by design. Um, but in general, try to practice these algorithm questions where you look at the solution and you're like, that's it, but getting to that solution is, is really hard, and that's actually the crux of the interview. We're not looking at, can you write those five lines of code? Next is the coding interview, and this is basically the opposite. This is a problem where the solution is, is fairly straightforward, and conceptually, it, it, you, know, you could probably understand it in, in just a few minutes, but then the process of coding it up is much more difficult. You know, maybe you actually need to write 50 to 100 lines of code to solve this, there might be a number of different corner cases you have to keep in mind or interesting sort of off by one errors you might run into. Um, and so this is sort of another type of interview question that you can practice. And again, you know, you're doing these practice problems, you can sort of you can sort of tell, like this seems like it's pretty simple, but then you go to write it out and you're like, okay, this there's some interesting corner cases here. The next type of interview you might run into is what's called practical interview. Um, and so th these can take a couple different forms. The first form might be an interviewer you know, even telling you, hey, bring your laptop to this interview and have it set up with your development environment of choice. I'm going to ask you to build something from scratch. You know, maybe it's a command line utility or, or a simple web application. But in the practical interview, you're using whatever language, technology, libraries, stack overflow, whatever you want. And this interview is basically assessing what are you, what is, you know, what are you like to work with in this sort of more natural environment that's not on a whiteboard or just writing some contrived algorithms? It, it's building something real. And then the other form this interview might take is the interviewer will give you some existing code base, often some, some large code base, and they'll ask you to fix a bug or make some changes to that code base. And what this is measuring is your ability to jump into some new area you've never seen before and, and start reasoning about the code and, and how it works. So these are, these are a little less common um, for people fresh out of school, but they, they do still exist. And so just, just be prepared for that. Uh, also less common for people fresh out of school are systems design interviews. And again, these, are, these can take two forms and, and both are a little less about coding. The first form this might take is a technical design question. So an interviewer might have a 45 minute conversation with you about how would you architect the Gmail app? Or if you were building Gmail from scratch, what would you do? You know, what, what database would you pick? What schema would you design? What's the communication layer between the client and the server? You know, what are, what are some things you'd have to keep in mind when it comes to you know, maybe a, a bad internet connection or latency or accessibility, things like that. 
So this is sort of an, an architecture question where you'll sort of talk about what components you would build and how they fit together. Then the second form this system design question might take, uh, even if you're just applying for an engineering role, is a product design question. Now maybe it's, it's if you were designing Gmail, what would you do? Or what's the feature that's most missing from the Gmail app? Um, you'll probably run into these uh, tailored to the question to the company you're applying to. So if you know if you're applying to Airbnb or if you might say, you know, what's missing from the Airbnb app. And so keep that in mind as you're going into these. Just think about this in advance. You know, use the company's product and just think about what do you like about this product and what do you wish were different, and, and just have that ready to go. You might not be asked it, but if you are, you're you don't have to sort of like think about it on the spot. Uh, and then lastly, uh, you'll almost definitely run into any, this one, regardless of what uh, level of experience you are, is this culture interview. And so this, this interview is, is just trying to get at who you are as a person. So the culture interview, again, will have sort of two parts to it. One part is looking back, and one part is looking forward. So looking back, you'll be asked to talk about some previous experience you had, maybe your time at a prior internship, maybe... Um, you know, some research you've done, if you've done academic research. So just be prepared to talk about some previous experience you have. You know, think about what challenges you faced, think about what feedback you got, think about what you're most proud of, think about what you might have done differently. Just sort of take some time and introspect and, and have all of this stuff ready to go, uh, rather than trying to think about it on the spot and then realizing in retrospect, you know, you said something silly. Just think about this in advance and be ready to talk about some past experience. And then for looking forward, think about what you want next. You know, when, when we were talking earlier about what questions to ask yourself as you're applying to different companies, you've already asked yourself this question. What are you looking to get out of this, this role? So your interviewer is also going to want to learn about that. They're going to want to know what are your short-term goals, what are your long-term goals. So again, just be prepared to talk about what you're looking for and talk about, you know, are you looking for mentorship or growth or collaboration or learning? Everyone's different, but just have, have this ready to go. Tommy, can I interject with a question about system design? Yes. Uh, so Swapnil from India asked how to prepare for system design as a fresher. And similarly, Rashmi from Canada asked how they would practice system design questions. Do you have any recommended resources? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, and so something I like to do is, is actually just look at my phone, look at a few apps that are on there, and think about how would I build this. You know, so maybe it's, it's Twitter is, is a decent example. And you think about, OK, how would I build Twitter? OK, well, I'm going to need a database for tweets. I'm going to need uh, some iPhone app. OK, now how are those going to communicate? OK, maybe I'll create a JSON API. OK, well, what should that JSON API look like? Like, what should each of those entries go through? And just sort of go through that exercise. You know, it doesn't have to be a mobile app. It could be any app, but I think uh, your phone is sort of a good inspiration for things you use every day. Um, and for practicing, we'll, we'll get to, to this in a bit. I'd really recommend just practicing with friends. You know, pick a, pick a buddy who can be a, a mock interviewer, and, and you can sort of go through that conversation yourself. Um, especially if there's someone a bit more experienced than you, that can help, but that doesn't have to be. You know, someone at, at equal levels of experience could say, okay, you, you told me you want to have a JSON API. What's going to be in that API? And then sort of, you know, pretend to, to be the interviewer. So um, I, would, I, would, I would worry the least about this of the five, uh, especially if you're just coming out of undergrad. But, you know, just sort of going through those exercises a few times can, can make it so that you're not totally taken off guard if you do run into this. Um, but oftentimes when you're interviewing, not all interviews are equal. So if, for instance, we do ask a, a new grad a systems design question and they don't do that well, the hiring manager might be like, eh, it's fine. Like, we didn't think they were going to do that well anyway. We just wanted to give them a shot to see how they would do. So, so keep that in mind, too, that um, if you're an undergrad or fresh out of school, the algorithm stuff is the most important. If you've got five plus years of experience, then systems design coding is, is probably more important, especially culture is more important there, too. All right, so let's dive into actually preparing for these interviews now that you have a sense of what's coming down the pipeline. So you want to start with the basics. So something throughout this talk is going to be that the more you practice, the less stressed you're going to be, which sounds obvious, but it really makes a big difference in interviewing. When you're interviewing, it's a really stressful experience or someone you've never met before judging your performance on coding and you're put on the spot to solve some problem that you've never seen before and there's a time limit. It's this inherently stressful experience. But the more you practice, the more you're going to be less stressed because you're not going to be worrying about some of this basic stuff. So first, pick a language to interview in. Pick this well in advance and stick to this. 
when you're given a problem, you shouldn't be asking yourself, should I use Python or Ruby? You should know that in advance. I'm just going to use Python for everything. That's my language. Nearly every interviewer is going to let you pick the language that you want. They're not interested if you're a Ruby or a Python master, unless they tell you in advance. So pick this language and then learn it. Make sure you know its syntax, you know its built-ins, and you know common error messages. So that way, when you are in the interview and you're thinking, how do I reverse a string? Is it string.reverse? Is it reversed of string? Just don't have to worry about that. If you practice the basics in advance, you will not have to worry about this, and you'll have everything down cold. Same thing with error messages. If you're writing some Java and you know what the common compiler error messages are and you know how to fix them, you won't have to stress about that in the middle of an interview. And Tommy, a couple of folks have asked about which languages they should ideally have going into an interview. Yeah, that's, that's a good question, too. The, the simple answer is the language you are most comfortable with. Um, but if you're sort of deciding, you know, I'm not comfortable with any language, or I, I sort of want to pick a good one, I think Python is a decent choice. Um, the characteristics I would look for are languages that have a decent standard library. So you don't have to, you know, C doesn't have, uh, you know, a bunch of stuff built into it, like trees or reversing a string or hash tables. Um, so pick a language with a lot of stuff that's built in, like Python or Ruby. Um, and, and also pick a language that uh, isn't super verbose. Uh, you know, languages like Java are known for, you know, you have to define a class, define a method, and they're sort of more verbose. And if the more verbose it is, the more you have to practice and memorize in advance. So starting from scratch, I would pick a scripting language, maybe Python, maybe JavaScript that's got some stuff built in. Um, but otherwise, if you're if you've been you know doing Java for all of your undergrad for four years and you love Java, you're really comfortable with it. Don't try to go learn Python a week before an interview. Stick with Java because that's what you know. And so next, you know, what what should you know how to do? So here are some super simple basics. You should know how to create a function, define a class, and then work with common data structures like strings or lists or trees. Again, you shouldn't be thinking in an interview, oh crap, how do I define a return type in this language? You should just know that. Practice in advance so that it just doesn't become a stress point for you while you're in the interview. Another thing that sort of falls into this basic camp is doing runtime analysis. So like I said before, we're as the interviewer, we're not looking for you to come up with some crazy, complicated complexity analysis. You know, we're not, I don't care if you're telling me, you know, the, the runtime is, you know, O of the square root of the log of 1 over n. You're just not going to see that. You basically just want to say, does my code fall into one of these five major categories? Is it constant, logarithmic, linear, polynomial, or exponential? Uh, and more often than not, we're just looking to recognize when something is exponential and say, OK, this is exponential. How can I bring this down to, to linear or constant? So we, again, that just sort of practice these and being able to identify if a solution falls into one of these five buckets. Don't try to go crazy with the like proving runtime or like deep down that math rabbit hole because interviewers are just not, they're not interested in that and they're not going to give you a problem that even requires that much math. Okay, so once you've got the basics down, you know your language down cold, you know it's standard library, you know how to create a hash table and reverse a string, you know how to do that. Next is you want to start building up your toolbox. So many interview problems reduce down to just a few core concepts. And so what you can do is practice these core concepts and practice problems in these domains. And then when, you're, when you get an interview question you know, in a real interview, you can sort of think about which of these tools in my toolbox can I use to solve this problem. So just a few tools. Recursion is super common. Um, definitely be, com be comfortable writing recursive functions going into an interview and using that for divide and conquer type algorithms. Graph searches are super common, something like breadth first search or depth first search, and just, you know, given a tree or a graph, how do I traverse that? Uh, greedy algorithms, super important, which you've uh, seen in CS50. Strings manip string manipulation problems are, are really common, something, you know, is this string a palindrome or uh, how do I reverse the string? Or you just, just sort of like simple string stuff. Just it's an area that you can just practice in. Um, knowing searching and sorting algorithms off the top of your head is, is helpful. You know, being able to write binary search is really useful. Probably, you know, being able to write uh, insertion sort from scratch is probably not so useful. But being aware of you know how to sort a list and what the runtime of sorting that list is is useful. Uh, and then lastly, dynamic programming, which is a, a concept that you'll probably run into in an algorithms class if you haven't taken one yet. 
Uh, and these are probably more geared at sort of more experienced folks, you know, rising juniors, rising seniors anyway. But basically, this is just a, a programming technique you can use to take something that was exponential runtime and, and make it faster. A lot of problems are sort of designed for this. So that, that's an area that I'd practice as well if you're not familiar with it. So those are the concepts. And now think about the tools you have at your disposal. So as you're solving some problem, think about, OK, can I use an array here? Maybe a linked list makes sense, maybe a hash table. Uh, can I make this go faster with a binary search? Maybe there's some cool shortest path algorithm I can use. Uh, memoization or caching is, is sort of another a simple way of implementing dynamic programming to make something go faster. But again, just learn learn these tools. And when you're given a problem, you can think about, I know this set of tools in my head. Which of these tools can I apply to solve this problem? So next, as you're practicing, make sure you accurately simulate the environment. So I, I've noticed a tendency, what people tend to do is they'll look at a problem and they'll think about it for a few minutes and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, I can see how that works. And then they just look at the answer. That does not count as practice. And if anything, it, it makes it worse because you often don't actually totally see the answer. And once you see the answer key, there's actually a bunch of stuff that you didn't realize you would have missed. So don't do that. Accurately simulate what an interview is gonna look like. So that means try using a pen and paper. Don't, using a, don't use a computer at all. Um, some interviewers will literally do your coding interview in a Google doc because they do not want to give you the ability to run your code so that they can see how you work without a compiler or without being able to run your code. So simulate that yourself. Also time yourself. You know, if you know an interview is gonna take 45 to 60 minutes, don't give yourself three hours to solve the problem because that doesn't accurately simulate what you're gonna have to do. So make sure you're aware of, of how long your time, you know, how much time you're taking on these practice problems. And again, don't cheat. Don't look at, don't look at Stack Overflow. Don't Google things if you're not allowed to Google things in interviews because it doesn't accurately simulate the environment. Then as you're doing all these practice problems, look for patterns in your performance. So, you know, let's say that you do, you know, three recursion problems, three string problems, and three graph problems. And let's say you get all the string ones, you do okay on the graph ones, but you didn't get any of the recursion ones. That means that you need to go focus on recursion. And again, everybody's different. So I, I won't say everyone, you know, focus on this 80%, focus on this 20%. What you should do is, is self-assess, learn what your strengths and weaknesses are, and then go in and practice the stuff that you are not good at, which is different with everybody. Uh, and then lastly, practice with friends. You know, a lot of interviewers are gonna be somebody giving the problem and, and interviewing, and then simulating that can be useful since, you know, maybe, you know, your friend has a problem that they already know the answer to, and they can possibly give you a hint or help you, which is, again, more accurate of a representation of an interview than just being alone. So if you can, definitely recommend getting some buddies to, to practice with. Okay, so that's everything before the interview. So now let's talk about the interview itself. So something I'm gonna repeat a bunch is that during the interview, it is not the output that matters, it's the process. That means that you could write perfectly correct code very quickly and still not pass the interview. What we're looking for as interviewers is the process that got you there. How are you able to reason through the problem, how you're able to communicate, how you're able to respond to changing environments. So I've done plenty of interviews where the interviewer did not get the correct answer, but they still moved on in the process because I got a good picture of what it's like to collaborate and they did a really great job collaborating, vocalizing their thought process, even if they did not get the correct code. So keep this in mind throughout. So interviews are going to start with some sort of icebreaker. No interviewer is going to say, hi, my name's Tommy, given a sorted list of integers. Like, that's just not how interviews start. They're going to introduce themselves, and they're going to want you to introduce yourself. So before you start, take a deep breath before you answer the phone or before you click the, the Zoom button so that you're, you feel good to go. And before, have an intro prepared. You know, they're, they're going to ask you, what's your name? Where did you go to school? What are you looking for? You know, what, what's something cool you've done lately? And, and just have this prepared, particularly if you're really nervous about this. You know, don't stress out about having to come up with some interesting story on the spot. Just, just have it ready to go. Just, re just eliminate that source of stress entirely. So be ready to talk about something you've worked on or be ready to talk about a class you're taking. Uh, and again, don't, don't ramble here. We're not looking for like a 20 minute monologue about who you are. We're just looking for a quick one to three minutes. Here's who you are. Here's where you're from. Here's something you've worked on lately. Um, so just have this ready to go before the interview starts. So next, the interviewer will give you some technical problem. And again, don't panic. This is, you know, 
it's really important. Try not to just like get super nervous and break down. Just don't panic. Think about all the preparation you've done and how that's going to reduce all the stress. So don't worry as soon as you get the interview problem. You're going to get through it together. Something that's really, really important is once the interviewer has given you a problem, you really need to tell them if you've already seen that problem before. So for instance, if last week you did this exact practice problem, don't try to pretend like you've never seen that way before and, and you know you think you're going to win the Academy Award of, of interviewing. It does not work. Interviewers absolutely know if you have seen a problem before and you're pretending. Uh, I do not believe I've ever been, been fooled by this. So it's a really easy way to get instantly rejected is to lie. Uh, so don't lie. Uh, just tell the interviewer if you've seen that before. Sometimes they'll even say, oh, that's okay, let's just do it anyway. Um, but you've told them in advance so that they, they later don't realize that they were lying. Uh, back at Quora, there are a number of cases where, you know, someone was on an on-site loop and they had, you know, two or three different interviewers uh, and the interviewers forgot to tell each other what questions they've asked. So interviewer one asked the same question as interviewer two. And we'd know if someone's lying at that point because, you know, as we had candidates who didn't say, oh, I just did that question. So tell your interviewer if you've seen it. Next, after you have the question, ask clarifying questions. Make sure that you understand the problem. One of the worst things you can do is go off on a 20 minute rant or, or write code for 20 minutes. That doesn't solve the problem, uh, which, which sounds sort of wacky, but I've seen it plenty of times because some of these problems can be sort of, sort of nuanced. So something I like to do is verify some output for some input. So if your interviewer says, you know, write, it, write a function that does X, you say, okay, so if I got the inputs ABC, I should output Y. And the interviewer say, yep, that's right. And so it sort of confirms that you understand what you're trying to do here uh, and that you don't go off on some crazy angle. So next, it's going to be on you to start solving the problem. So here, always think out loud. Uh, and you're going to feel sort of weird, like vocalizing your thought process, or you might feel like, this is strange. I just want to like go off in a corner for 15 minutes and think. Uh, unfortunately, you can't do that in a technical interview. Uh, reason being, if you're off, in you're off in a corner for 15 minutes, the interviewer is not getting any signal. They don't know what your thought process is like. They don't know what it's like to work for you. So even though that might be your ideal way of solving the problem, don't do that in a technical interview. Just practice and learn how to think out loud. And so while doing so, you know, it might be helpful to talk through different approaches. You know, you can start by saying, okay, well, we could use a linear search. Maybe you could use a binary search. Would that work? And, and just sort of walk, walk through that. Uh, and if it's helpful, you might want to draw a diagram, especially if you think uh, a tree is the right way to model a problem. You know, just sort of draw out a tree, either in, a, you know, ASCII art in the editor, or just, you know, if you're on a video call, have a pen and paper ready, and you can just show the interviewer on, on the video camera what that looks like. But particularly if you, you are sort of a, a visual type person, uh, don't be afraid to, to draw that diagram to help you visualize what's, what's actually happening. So now, as you're thinking through the problem, try to pattern match against what you know. So this is why it's so important to build that toolbox in advance and go through all those practice problems in advance, because you can start to pattern match some problem against something you've already seen. So for instance, in your toolbox, there's things like graphs and searches and recursion and uh, memoization. So just think about it. Can we can this problem actually be formulated as a graph? You know, maybe this it's not open with, hey, here's a graph. How do you do a search? But maybe you can think to yourself, OK, well, I'm trying to find something. Maybe if I represent or model this problem as a graph, I can actually just traverse that graph to find the solution. Uh, or similarly, maybe this is a problem where I can actually break this down into different subproblems and then sort of cache the answers to those and, and build up those smaller subproblems into that larger solution. So again, this, this pattern matching is really important, and that's one reason why it's, it's so important to do a bunch of these problems in advance. It's so that you can pattern match against them. So when you're approaching a problem, always think general before specific. So something you should not do when solving a problem is try to list out a million corner cases in advance. Even though you might see, okay, well, if the input is zero, I know the answer is going to be this. And if the input is one, the answer is going to be this. Don't do that. You're just going to sort of waste your time and you can often get down the wrong track. But think generally. Think, okay, what, what is common about all these solutions? And you know, let, let's say you're writing something recursively. Think about what the base case and the recursive case are. Don't think about a million corner cases that where the answer happens to be obvious. And on a related note, if you're writing out your solution or you're even just describing your solution, if it seems too complicated, it probably is. These aren't 
you know, these crazy hard problems that it takes, you know, a mathematician six days to solve, they're designed to be solved in 30 to 45 minutes, which means they're not designed to be super complicated. So if you find yourself in this super complicated solution, take a step back and think to yourself, how can I simplify this, right? I think I'm, I'm, think I'm making this too complicated. And then as you're thinking about a solution, you might get really stuck and that's okay. If you get, you sort of hit a wall and you just don't know, just ask your interviewer for help. Saying something as simple as, I'm not sure where to go next, uh, or I'm not sure I really see a solution here. It, it can be the difference between you struggling for, for 10 minutes and you sort of getting a hint and then getting the answer. You know, obviously, if, if the interviewer is giving you lots of hints and you're not able to solve things independently, that, that's not good, uh, especially if an interviewer is looking for you to solve the problem independently. But at the same time, if you're just like totally stuck, you hit a wall, it's much better to ask for help than to just sit staring at a wall for, for 30 minutes. And lastly, before you write a single line of code, make sure you have explained your solution and your interviewer agrees with you that it's going to work. All right, if you explain a solution and you're convinced it's going to work and your interviewer doesn't sort of agree with you or indicate that you're on the right track and then you go off and, and spend 45 minutes writing it and then it doesn't work, that, you know, that, that's end of interview. You've, you've sort of burned it. Um, so make sure you both agree that what the code you're about to write is, you know, what, what that code is going to do, agree on that upfront before you start typing a bunch of stuff. And again, process, not output. As you're thinking about the solution to the problem, it's not about whether or not you get it instantly. It's about whether or not you're able to vocalize your thought process and reasonably think through all the constraints of this problem. And Tommy, a number of folks asked, and perhaps the most pointed formulation of this question was from Mohammed from Egypt, how to handle the stress during the interview if you're not sure how to approach the problem in code. Yeah, it, it, it's a really good question. And, and like I said, the most important thing to realize is interviews are inherently stressful. The interviewer knows that. They know that if you are sort of on your own or on the job already, that you're not going to, you know, you're going to perform differently and, and probably better because you're not under that stress. But for me, at least, and a lot of people that, that I've interviewed, the best way to alleviate stress is just to practice. Know exactly what you're getting into. Practice a really wide variety of problems and have a good sense of what these things you can pattern match against are. Um, otherwise, you know, sometimes it, it can help to just take a deep breath, you know, take a step back. It's totally okay if you tell your interviewer, let me just, do you mind if I just think for a few seconds and take a deep breath and, and collect yourself? You don't have to be constantly talking every second of the interview. Just don't go off for like, you know, more than a few minutes without saying anything. So yeah, I think, I think unfortunately the reality is it's stressful and, and everybody knows it's stressful, but the, the more that you practice and the more that you know what's gonna happen, that, that sort of fear of the unknown goes away because you sort of know what, what you're getting yourself into. Okay, so, so now we're into actually writing code. So again here, constantly communicate. Something I'll even do is I'll just like almost verbalize the code I'm writing. So I'll, let's say I'm creating a function. I'll say, okay, well, I'm going to create a function. Let's call it find minimum. It's going to take one parameter. And as I'm talking, I'm, I'm typing and I'm sort of describing the, the code that I'm writing. And again, this feels really weird. Uh, and you wouldn't ever do this as an engineer. You wouldn't be typing and talking at the same time. That's really weird. But it helps the interviewer understand what you're thinking. And maybe they can see, okay, the thing you just said and the code that you just typed, they don't match. And so they can help you understand that and find that bug. And, and also you might find yourself find catching these bugs. Then another really important thing is get something working. So a lot of folks when they're interviewing, they, they come up with a solution and they perhaps correctly recognize it's not the optimal solution. It's it's maybe, you know, a little bit slower or takes too much memory. And then they won't even write that up and they'll try to jump to the, the harder solution. Don't do that. It's always better to leave an interview having written something than having written nothing, right? If you spend the entire 45 minutes trying to get some crazy optimized runtime and, and then leave the interview not having written any code, that probably didn't go well because the, interview the interviewer didn't get the signal that they were looking for. So if you come up with a naive solution, just ask your interviewer, should I should I code this up? And they'll probably say yes, because they want to see your ability to code something else, to code something up. And then once you have the simple version working, then go off and simplify or optimize or, or make whatever changes you need to make. But that way, at least you've written something down. And then in the process of writing the simpler solution, you've, you've had more time to think about this optimized version. So uh, it can help actually get you to the right solution. Uh, and then lastly, listen to your interviewer. Uh, as, as someone who's interviewed a lot of people, I want everyone I interview to succeed. It is not fun for me as the interviewer to watch someone struggle and flail. 
and I want to help them. And oftentimes, because I want to help you, I'll, I'll offer you hints. You know, maybe you're, you're sort of on the right track, but going down, you know, taking a wrong turn, I'll, I'll say, well, actually, what, what if we do this instead? Uh, or say something like, well, have you thought about what would happen if the input looked like this? If I say something, it's me trying to help. Uh, I'm never going to offer some, like, you know, throw you on the wrong path intentionally or expect you to, like, prove me wrong. I'm trying to help. And the interviewer has probably seen this problem dozens, maybe hundreds of times. So they know all of the different things that are going to work and not work. So if your interviewer tells you that something you're doing is probably not going to work, listen to them. Don't, don't argue and try to convince them that it's not because the chances that you are right are really low. <laughs> maybe you are, and that's, that's great, but the chances you're right are really low. So listen to your interviewer and, and you know, if they give feedback or pointers, take, take them. Don't, don't argue with them. Again, sounds obvious. You'd be surprised at how many people have told me I don't know what a binary tree is. So then when you're writing code, um, the code itself, always create a function that returns the answer. I've seen some people just sort of like start writing like, you know, an, an if statement into a blank editor uh, and then sort of like hard code the input and variables. Don't, don't do that. We're, we're expecting you to create a function that returns the answer, not, not print the answer, not whatever, returns the answer. So just assume that unless you're told otherwise that that's what you're expected to do. Then as you're writing code, try to code quality matters. Try to follow you know good code quality practices that you know like the ones you learned in CS50. We're decomposing large blocks of code into smaller functions as needed, using readable variable names, factoring out common logic. You know we're not looking for you to write this extremely super clean code, but we're also not looking for single variable names or anything like that. And again, process not output. We care about how you write the code more than we care about the precise code that you wrote. OK, so last up, you've written your solution. Now you want to make sure that it works. Something to not do is write the code as soon as you type your last semicolon, say done, and expect the interviewer to like test your code for you. You want to verify that your solution works. And the best way to do that is to pretend that you are the computer. So take the input that you agreed on at the beginning of the interview said this is the input let's let's take this as the output and just run your function sort of walk step through every line line by line and sort of say okay my function starts here well first this is going to happen and then we're going to enter this branch and then we're going to call ourselves recursively again and, and just walk through and then you can verify what your code is actually doing just pretend that you're a computer or a debugger and, and step through line by line and do that out loud, verbally reason about what's happening in your code, what state is changing, what memory is being used, etc. And as you're doing this, look out for bugs. If an interviewer tells you that there's a bug and they fix it, and you fix it, that's great. But if you identify there's a bug and then you fix it, that's even better because it shows that you're proactively looking for issues with your code and you're verifying that it's actually correct. So take the time to actually look for bugs and don't expect an interviewer to sort of point out any issues for you. I, you know, I've seen a lot of people who are like, okay, does it work? And my answer is always, I don't know, you tell me. You know, because, I mean, I know if it works, but I want you to see you verbally reason through your code and, and see if it actually does. There's a category of interviews where you can actually run your code. I think this is actually becoming more and more common, which I think is a good thing, so it's a bit more realistic. But if you cannot run your code, definitely reason through verbally. Even if you can run your code on a computer, uh, you know, i.e. The, the interviewer allows you to, still run through verbally to sort of show you can reason through about your code and, and confirm that it works. But then if you can run the code, actually write out some test cases. You know, you don't have to use some like unit testing framework or anything. You could even just like, you know, use print statements or use simple assert statements, but write them out and make sure that your code actually works. If you run your code and it doesn't work, now you're, you're in debugging mode. Something to not do is, is like flip into guess and check mode where you're like, like, okay, well this, this, there's an if statement here. Let me try a plus one. That didn't work. Let me try a minus one w without even thinking about it. Try to reason about what your bugs are and identifying them. And so, you know, don't run your code every like three seconds. Like run your code when you're confident you've made a change that is going to change the result to the correct answer. And lastly, if you can, uh, you want to use prints or debug statements and, and try to print out the, all the relevant state. You know, I've seen a lot of cases where people are just like printing out just the answer and they're like, huh, that didn't work. And then they sort of guess and check and print out just the answer and they're like, oh, nope, still didn't work. Print out all of the relevant state. You know, maybe you're maintaining some list, maybe there's some counter variable. Just print out a bunch of stuff to get a sense for what your code is doing as you run it. So the same advice I'd have for just programming generally, but especially when you're interviewing and you're under a time crunch, 
printing out as much as possible about what the state is and what's happening under the hood can help you identify issues faster. And you know, time time matters here. So again, it's about the process, not the output. If you run into a bug, great, because now we get to see what it's like for you to debug. If you don't run into bugs, okay, fine, good job. Uh, you probably will. And so it's not about whether or not you wrote bug-free code or fixed all the bug instantly. It's about you ran into a bug, what did you do? What was your thought process? Did you panic or were you able to print out the relevant state and reason about what's gonna happen in order to fix it? Okay, so really quickly, I just wanna run through an example problem. So you can see sort of all of this advice and you know what it might look like to go through an interview. So here's an interview question. I think this is actually a pretty representative of what a typical phone screen question might be. Um, so just to run through this, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take something called a rotated array. So if we have one, two, three, four, fives, to rotate that array means I'm going to shift every number to the right. And as soon as that number, the last number goes out of bounds of the array, it's going to wrap around. So if I were to shift this array three times, I would get this number. You can see the one is basically shifted three places to the right, and then every number has, has wrapped around. So the problem statement is, given just this right array, find the number of times that it was rotated. So that's the problem. We're in a phone screen. Interviewer just said that. Now what? So first, let's approach the problem. Number one, we are not panicking. We've done a lot of practice. We know what we're expecting. We're not panicked. So we're going to confirm that we understand the problem. So in this case, it was nice because it gave us that input and output. So what I would do is I would just give another one. So I'd say, OK, so if I had 2, 4, 6 and rotated it twice, I would get this, right? And the viewer says, yep, that's right. I say, OK, great. Now I'm confident I understand the problem. Next, if I have any clarifying questions, I'm going to ask them. So for instance, I might say, in this list, we'll only, you know, we'll only have sorted integers. And you really say, yep, it will. So OK, great. I'm confirmed the list is sorted. I've confirmed there's just integers. I don't have to worry about uh, anything crazy there. So again, it, it might be obvious. You might think you know, but don't make any assumptions without explicitly stating them, or you're going to end up on the wrong track. OK, so what I would do next is I would look at the example the interviewer gave. So this was their example. One, two, three, four, five rotated three times is this. So OK, so what are we looking for here? So I realized, OK, what we're looking for is we're looking to find this number where both the left and the right are larger, right? Because I've rotated three times, and the number at index three, well, OK, that actually looks like the left and the right are larger. Maybe that's what I want. So in this case, we can see that because this list was sorted, this is actually going to be the minimum. And so I'd say, okay, is that that's kind of a cool observation. Is it is that true? So let me look at my other example again and say, okay, yeah, actually this is generally true. So okay, first thing that jumps to mind in my toolbox is well, we can just linear search and find the minimum or find this case where the number to the left and the right are both larger. And I'll, I would I would say that. And then the interviewer might say something like, sure, let's let's code that up. And then I'll I'll go and code it up. Or they might say, Sure, that'll work, but linear search is, is so obvious that let's not waste time writing that up. Let's see if you can find a faster solution. So this is this is almost one of the, the most dreaded phrases you can hear in an interviewer is when your interviewer says, sure, but can you do better? Uh, and when that happens, we are still not panicking. So what do we do? We turn back to our toolbox. So what do we got? We've got recursion, divide, and conquer. Uh, eh, kind of. Maybe there's some way to formulate this recursively. I don't know if I see it immediately. Let's keep going. Can we formulate this as a graph? Eh, probably not. It's just sort of a single single array of numbers. I don't really see the graph search. Uh, could we do something greedily? Eh, not really. We're sort of like searching for something. I don't know about that. Strings, no, we're all integers. Doesn't help. How about binary search? OK, now this is something, right? Binary search works when you have some sorted list of integers. And, and this is like sort of sorted, right? Like everything is in order except for this rotation. So maybe we, maybe we could do something with, with binary search here. And so what to realize is that this problem is just binary search, but with a different sort of a win condition or search condition. Rather than looking for some particular number, we're looking for this number where both the left and the right are larger. So we can say, OK, let's let's start with binary search, and let's just modify it a bit. Rather than just returning when you hit some number, we're going to return when this new condition is met, which is when uh, we find this minimum of the array, or both the left and the right are larger. 
So here we go. So I, I formulated the solution. I've described this to my interviewer. This is binary search, but we're changing the search condition. We're instead going to look for the number where both the left and the right are larger. That represents the minimum of the array, and the index of that number is the answer. The interviewer says, yep, that's it. Let's write some code. So the first thing I do is I just write binary search. I practice this. I have this down cold. I don't have to worry about how do I write binary search. Just practice this. You don't have to worry about it. So all this is is binary search. You'll notice that I gave everything sort of a, a nice variable name. There's no single letter variables. Uh, I've started with a function. I have a function that's going to take the list as input. It's going to eventually return the output. Uh, and then I've just written this out. This is just binary search. The only thing I haven't done is written the base case, or basically written the case where I find the result that I'm looking for. So let's do that. So the result I'm looking for is this is basically, you know, it's, it's sort of in between these two numbers. So let's look at to the right and let's look to the left. Say, so, okay, that's going to work, but remember that we're wrapping things around. So I'm going to run out into an index out of bounds error potentially, right? If mid is zero, I'm going to end up negative. Or if mid is the end of the list, I'm going to go past it. And because we're doing rotations, let's, let's, fix, let's fix that bug next. So this is nice. This is just an, a nice trick that doing practice problems, you know off the top of your head, here's how to wrap around a number either to the right or to the left. I shouldn't have to like derive this in the middle of the interview because I've just done practice problems. This is decently common in practice problems. You'll, you'll definitely run into this. And so there we go. I fixed that bug. I didn't have to have the interviewer tell me there was a bug, but because I sort of thought about what state I could have and what mid could be, I recognized this bug myself. And then lastly, I'm going to run through this code and realize, okay, there's one condition I didn't keep, it, I didn't take into account here, and that's if the list is already sorted. It's basically never rotated at all, so I can just create a quick case that that takes that into account. And so now I've, I've written all this code. And so what am I going to do next? I'm going to run my code on the example input. So I'm going to be the computer and run through my code line by line. So I'm going to say, okay, given my binary search, we're going to land in the middle, which is on the five. 5 is greater than 4 and greater than 1 does not meet our condition. So what do we do next? We compare the 5 to the 3 and the 5 to the 2. And 3 is less than 5, so that means the minimum can't be over there because everything in between 3 and 5 must be in between them because the list is sorted. But 5 is greater than 2, so the minimum must be there because there must be a smaller number in between those two things. So we can move our binary search into the right half of this list. OK, then the middle of that list is going to be 1. Let's look to the left, 5 is greater. Let's look to the right, 2 is greater. That's it, we met our condition. So we're going to return the index of 1, which is 3, and this list has in fact been rotated three times. So that's it. The, the code there wasn't super long. It was you know 10 to 15 lines. I think this, this problem falls into this uh, algorithm category where I think, you know, realizing it was binary search was, was sort of the hard part, but then writing up binary search wasn't too hard because I've just got that down cold. Okay, now let's think about runtime. Again, keep thinking out loud here. Don't never stop thinking out loud. So we're saying, okay, let's think about the runtime here. Well, binary search, I just know, is O of log n. So this must be two. I didn't really make any comp any modifications here, and that's it. Nothing terribly complicated. Uh, and then we'll just do one last check for bugs, and then we're done. So that's it. That's sort of what, what the thought process looks like, and everything that your interviewer is going to be looking for. You know, from thinking about the solution, thinking out loud, applying your toolbox, writing out the code, looking for bugs, and running the code verbally. That's sort of what, what we'd be looking for out of that interview. So last, just wrapping up after the interview. So after the technical question, your interviewer will almost certainly ask you, so do you have any questions for me? There aren't very many bad answers to this question, except for no. Uh, that is a universally bad answer. So just have some questions ready in advance. Uh, and importantly, have some questions ready that you can't just Google. So, you know, don't ask like, you know, how big is your team? Or don't ask like, you know, what, what do you, you know, what do you, what does your team work on broadly? Just stuff that's like obvious, don't ask. Ask about something you'd, you'd only get from the opportunity to talk to this person. Like, what does your typical day look like? What is your team culture? What's something you wish you could change? What's a project that you are proud of recently? And what does your path of this company look like? These are all things that you cannot Google, and they're, and they're sort of personal. You're hearing about this person's experience, which for you as the interviewer is really useful because you're learning about 
what this company might be. You know, hopefully at the end of the day, you'll get an offer for this company and you have to decide whether or not you want to take it. And these questions can, can really help you. A lot of other, a lot of companies too, once you receive an offer, they'll set up these reverse interviews with your potential coworkers. Because again, they're, they're trying to sell you on this offer. And so they want to give you information about what it would be like to work at this company. So same thing here. Ask these questions that are, are much more personal and not something you can get just by Googling. Uh, and last, the, the most important thing you should do after an interview is don't worry. Uh, interviews are extremely high variance. There are lots of really great engineers, including myself, who goes into an interview and just totally bombs. Uh, I'll never forget one of the earliest interviews I did. I broke nearly every rule that I have talked in this talk, uh, talked about here. It's, it was this Facebook interview, and it was this problem about uh, binary trees, and I hadn't practiced binary trees. And the problem set I was working on was in this language called OCaml, which I did not know very well. But I said, well, I just wrote some OCaml. I'm going to pick OCaml for this interview, even though I've never written OCaml before. And I got absolutely nowhere. I like the syntax didn't make sense. I did not even try to verbalize the solution first. I just wrote a bunch of code, and it didn't work. Uh, and I absolutely bombed. And the reason I know I bombed was because after the interview, I was walking down the hallway, and my interviewers were uh, in an elevator. And they were talking about how bad I did. Uh, as I walked into the elevator, and it was the most awkward elevator ride, possibly of definitely of my life, possibly also of their life. Uh, but it's it's okay, you know. Everyone everyone happens to everybody. Hopefully you uh, you take the elevator by yourself. Um, but don't worry if this happens to you. Everyone bombs. Nobody likes interviewing. It's really stressful. But it is the only way for us as interviewers to understand what it would be like to work with and collaborate with you. So it is this very uh, necessary evil. So view each interview, whether you did well or not well, view each interview as an opportunity to get better. Think about what you did well, what you didn't do well, and, and try to be honest with yourself. Be like, okay, I think that my intro there was super solid, but then when they gave me the problem, I just sort of froze and I stopped talking. Next time, I'm not going to do that. And, and don't worry, you know, people can get rejected from companies and you know, we're not all going to like talk to each other. Just getting rejected at Facebook doesn't mean you're rejected from every Silicon Valley company. Uh, just view every opportunity, every interview as an opportunity to get better. And don't worry. Recognize that great people do horrible on interviews. So that's, that's everything. I just want to leave you with a few takeaways. One, have the basics down. Practice a language and syntax and built-ins in advance so you're not worrying about it during the interview. Next, build up your toolbox. Do lots of practice problems in a variety of different areas and just build up the set of tools like hash tables and link lists and binary search and graph searches. Just have these ready to go so that you can apply them in the interview rather than trying to remember how to do breadth for a search in an interview. Next, do lots of practice problems. Just once, once you think you've done all the practice problems you could possibly do, go do more. This is the best way to practice is to see what these questions look like, how to solve them, and you're going to start to see patterns that you can recognize and pattern match against in your interview. Next, before you write any code, communicate a solution. Make sure that you've thought about and verbalized your thought process to your interviewer before you put pen to paper or hand to keyboard or whatever you're using. And lastly, verbally run your code after you've written it and look for issues. This is how you're going to find issues with your code is by being the computer running through everything line by line. And remember, it is the process, not the output. Well, I want to be mindful of the team's time here. So I hope folks will indeed forgive if we can't quite field all questions. But thank you again to Tommy. And Tommy, shall we give you the final word of advice here? Oh, man. Uh... I think that the, the biggest thing is inter interviewing is hard. It's really stressful. It's not fun. Everyone's going to bomb an interview. If you bomb an interview, that's OK. It's, it's really intimidating. Don't, don't get discouraged. Just take this as an opportunity to learn and, and move on to the next one. And you're eventually going to get better at it. This is like, it's a skill. It's, it's a muscle you can build. The more you practice, the more you do it, the more you're going to get better at it. So I guess my parting words would be don't give up. Uh, and keep practicing, and, and you'll eventually get there. Thank you again to Tommy, and we'll see you all soon. We'll be in touch via email with links.